My name is Ivan Blinkov, and today I am going to share with you WDB's experience on working with raw disk drives in Kubernetes. A couple of words about myself. I work in data storage and processing industry for well over a decade, and during this time I worked on several database products, including two open source ones. So in the past I worked for seven years on ClickHouse, and my current role is Vice President Product and Open Source at YDB. Today's talk will consist of three main parts. First, I'll give you some context around what's YDB and why it works with raw disk drives directly. Then we'll explore how this all plays out in a Kubernetes environment. And finally, we'll recap what we learned along this journey. So to answer this question, uh, we need to start from the very beginning. But first of all, I want to clarify that by raw disk drives here, I uh, imply uh, working with disk drives via block device without uh, formatting them to any file system and mounting it, so directly with block device. Uh, so WDB is an open source distributed SQL database. It's designed for large scale workloads, think like petabytes of data, millions of requests per second, this kind of scale. Uh, and also designed for business critical applications that, that have really strict requirements on both data consistency and availability. That's why WDB provides distributed transactions with a serializable isolation level by default uh, and survives uh, most cases of hardware failures without human intervention, including large scale outages of the whole data center or availability zone. Initially, it started as a transactional database, but nowadays it's more like data platform that, that has other features like analytics, the topics similar to Apache Kafka topics, and so on. Uh, you can see typical use cases uh, on the screen. The point here is that uh, these kind of requirements typically come from two places, either from system directly managing business, business data, like orders for e-commerce sites, Taxi, taxi rights, clicks on advertisement, this kind of stuff that directly impacts business. And the second option is when you provide low level infrastructure for other businesses to rely on. And again, it multiplies the impact of any potential data inconsistencies or outages. Uh, so one more uh, piece of context I want to give you before we get, get back to the technical side of things is historical one. So um, the point here is uh, that YDB is a decade-old technology that was originally designed for bare metal environments, and thus we started working on Kubernetes compatibility re relatively recently, uh, three years ago. Uh, and also initially it was a proprietary technology that went open source in 2022. So it's, nowadays it's published uh, under Apache 2.0 license, uh, it's the same license Kubernetes uses, uh, so it's a permissive one. <clears throat> so on high level, YDB works like this. So to provide this kind of guarantees, it normally runs on a cluster. Cluster inside itself talks, nodes talk to each other via custom protocol built on TCP. Uh, but outside user applications talk with it via some well-known protocols. So here on the slide you see like our native way via based on gRPC, but also we have compatibility most with PostgreSQL and Kafka, so people can use uh, their client libraries and applications uh, if they want to. And you can also see what uh, blocks, colors mean on the legend. <coughs> so then once the requests come into system to the proxy, it passes it to query processor that kind of orchestrates distributed execution of uh, uh, whatever was requested. It leverages distributed transaction components uh, and most of YDB's functionality is built using a framework we call tablets. So a tablet in our, in our terminology is a lightweight user space process that have its own private state uh, uh, that it stores on a distributed storage layer, so it's always stored remotely. And tablets talk to each other via message passing, which is similar to actors you can find in Erlang or Akka or similar technologies. Uh, <coughs> So the most tricky part of this whole system is distributed storage. And as you can see, compute layer is more or less stateless. So that's, that's to run uh, compute layer in Kubernetes is easier, uh, but the tricky part is the storage layer, which we'll cover next. So to give the short, short um, uh, answer to the original question of why we use raw disk drives 
is for performance reasons. So <clears throat> and there are two main performance characteristics people care about distributed uh, transactional databases. Uh, first is transactional latency and then their throughput. Uh, so in terms of latency, there is always a lower bound that physically possible for distributed transaction to happen. This comes from algorithm that, uh, algorithms that ensure, uh, there are many of them, but all of them have require multiple network ho hops between nodes to ensure that transactions are executed correctly. And each network ho hop is uh, bound by basically distance between nodes, physical, physical distance and speed of light. So um, typically this kind of systems strive to uh, keep uh, latencies uh, reasonably close to what's theoretically possible, uh, at the same time trying to uh, maximize uh, throughput uh, with a given hardware capacity. And that's where this kind of question of disk drives and file systems come in. So we want to kind of use them as efficient, uh, use storage as efficiently as possible. So let's take a look at what a, a file system provides in this context. So first of all, it provides generic abstractions like files, folders, etc., which are great because like everyone knows how to use them. That's basically one less thing to learn uh, for new employees potentially. Uh, <coughs> Uh, but that's more or less it. Uh, and the f another important thing is that file, s file systems abstract away underlying storage devices. So your application can work with uh, any storage device without any changes, and that's good for general purpose applications that don't, don't really care, um, <clears throat> but not as much for systems that actually care about performance of the storage layer. And also uh, operating system provides other um, default implementations for other things like IO scheduling and page and caching and some other things. So, um, but the point here is that if you building a uh, IO intensive application like a database, uh, it's hard to rely fully on operating system because each file system be behave dif differently, uh, different Linux distros be be behave differently uh, and uh, uh, all of them don't really know about what you actually store in them for operating system. All you save is just bytes, uh, and they don't know if it's a uh, like piece of data for a table, or it's a, if it's an index, or maybe it's some debug info nobody really cares about. So for operating system, it's all the same, and you start investing more and more into building your own uh, the same things, but on a user space uh, wh wh where you can be aware of meaning and semantics of each piece of data and thus prioritize what to cache, what to write to disk faster, what, where, when to wait for confirmation, when not, and things like this. So, and um, once you invest uh, an, enough effort into building uh, user space, the same things in user space, uh, the question, the idea of ditching the whole file system thing uh, become, start, start, start sounding less, less, less crazy. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's what basically what WDB does. So it, uh, it's designed to work without any file system, to work with block drive directly. Uh, here are some uh, hints how to kind of do this. So first you'll still have to design data layout for dat your data structures. Uh, so it's kind of similar to designing custom file formats for your, for your applications, but now you have access to, to the whole device instead of part of it. Uh, now you suddenly can see what kind of device you are working with uh, uh, <clears throat> and kind of leverage their physical properties. For example, for rotating drives, uh, uh, they have higher throughput cl closer to, to their outer rim just because of how rotational physics work. Uh, you cover more ground uh, the further you are from center with the same rotation speed. Uh, and for, for example, for NVMe drives, they are not contiguous space physically. They consist of small um, blocks uh, that handle a small amount of data each. Uh, and devices can't, uh, and these devices can't uh, zero out individual bits. They zero out only the whole blocks. Uh, and thus, uh, suddenly, operation of changing a few bits from one to zero becomes expensive because you have to kind of copy copy the whole block, uh, all unmodified parts of a block to a new place, which is already full of zeros. And that's how you kind of zero out bits. Uh, so <coughs> you can start think, uh, looking at things like this. Um, uh, fun fact, like, uh, 
even though these devices have different physical properties, it kind of have the same conclusion what to, how to use them efficiently. It's to write data, data sequentially. Uh, and we, uh, WDB was doing this from very long time ago by, uh, by leveraging log structured merge tree data structures a lot. Uh, and it helped to adopt uh, NVMEs faster when be they, they became mainstream as well. Uh, then, uh, if, uh, even if you don't use any file system, uh, operating system and uh, devices themselves will still try to cache your data for you. Uh, and when you manage your caches on, a, on application level, uh, it does more harm than good. So you stop, not, you, you don't know whether a piece of data was persistent, persistent uh, or not if you, you know, let someone else to cache your data. Uh, and um, you don't get any extra performance benefit. That's why it usually makes sense in such scenarios to kind of disable all caches forcefully. Uh, same goes for IO scheduling. Uh, not as, as you do it on a uh, application level, you can know, hey, like this is important data, and I'll better put it on VME, and this is some like not so important data, I can put it on uh, slower HDDs. Uh, and you can also smartly um, separate bandwidths of each given de of each device you have be between application level processes you might have. And last but not least, check some everything because uh, all these drives fail sooner or later and you don't want to rely on some random bytes uh, you read back after the, the drive got corrupted. So now let's switch over to how this plays out in Kubernetes. <clears throat> so as I said in the beginning, we are initially kind of moving away from bare metal environments. So the first things we tried was on self-managed Kubernetes running on bare metal. Uh, and it was running on the same legacy hardware we had before. So when the first thing we tried is just to mount the um, um, devices directly to containers. Uh, by default, it's not allowed uh, because it requires super granting super user privileges on the host system to the containers. So it's possible to enable these privileges uh, with uh, spec you see on the slide. Uh, but um, it's not really usable in production environments because it introduces extra security risks that are, are undesirable and thus like we kind of ditch the whole, the whole idea here uh, and try to exploring others. So the next kind of straightforward way is uh, persistent volume with uh, volume lo mode block. Uh, so it's a great option if you have dynamic volume provisioning and some dynamic way to kind of manage your uh, devices. So newer YDB clusters that uh, uh, run, for example, in cloud environments uh, usually use this option, but it wasn't really working well in our original case when we were in this uh, legacy cluster because uh, it's uh, designed to be homogen a homogeneous device of the same size, which wasn't the case uh, uh, then. So the next approach is the one that uh, actually most current uh, large production clusters of YDB running on the same self-managed bare metal Kubernetes is using is called Kubelet device plugin. So it's an API that's part of Kubernetes. Uh, that was initially designed to manage other kinds of devices like GPUs, FPGAs, and others. Uh, it appeared to be working fine for these drives as well. Let's see how this uh, uh, plays out. Uh, so when Kubelet uh, learns which devices are available on the host system, uh, Kubernetes allows you to inject a um, custom piece of code to kind of intercept this process and change something. So what we had to do in our case is, um, well, there are some other things, but the main thing we uh, we needed to do is to set uh, read-write permissions for the drives that each port needed to use. Uh, and um, that's basically allowed uh, to uh, get the same result we were having with the first naive approach of just mounting the block devices, uh, but without the need to grant super user pri privileges. So if you happen to need specifically this, there's a QR code leading to an open source implementation of uh, this de device plugin API that does this uh, permission management. 
And there are a couple more alternative options that are, are on our radar, but um, uh, I'm not aware of any production cluster of YDB actually using them, but there are users that are kind of exploring them and uh, thinking about uh, whether it makes sense. Uh, so first is local persistent volume static provisioner. It's a project maintained by special interest group storage of Kubernetes itself. So unlike the previous approach, it, it's specifically intended for managing these volumes. Uh, and it also has uh, block device mode. Um, QR code is for project uh, page or GitHub, I think. Um, yeah, and the next thing uh, that's kind of upcoming and also looks promising, it's called dynamic resource allocation. Uh, so it seems like it will be able to uh, replace the current approach of Kubelet device plugin I just covered. Um, and the main downside that it's currently in alpha, so like it needs to get to closer to production readiness to be considered uh, for real. Also link to uh, project page. Uh, and the last topic I wanted to cover here today is trade-offs around various uh, drive types you use in your Kubernetes cluster. So um, this is super high level and simplified table uh, because uh, each of these drive categories might be subdivided into multiple. Uh, we've already touched a bit on physical device types. Our rates also have their operation modes. There are tons of, of implementation of network block devices. You can get one from your cloud provider. There are projects like Longhorn uh, and so on. And then uh, there might be more, disk, uh, more storage types uh, added uh, below, like, I don't know, object stores or network file systems. So there are many ways how you could store data. Uh, and similarly, this table could have expanded uh, with columns. You might care about capacity or costs or something else. So this table is just what made sense in, um, in our situation. But the point here is if you really care about uh, characteristics of a given subsystem, kind of m make it explicit about what you care about and um, like consider your trade-offs. So in our case, uh, <coughs> The ultimate goal, goal was still, still performance, uh, but uh, what really was important here is the reliability column. So because YDB has all this uh, rel reliability built-in application level, because it was kind of designed to work on unreliable things that might go, go, go offline or be corrupt, corrupted at any moment, it doesn't really make sense to use uh, 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 drive types that also has this built in into it because it doesn't really multiply this reliability because, uh, for example, network block devices, uh, they usually do the same thing that WDB does uh, internally to provide this uh, extra reliability for general purpose VMs uh, they were designed to uh, handle. So actually there are a couple cloud providers, uh, smaller ones, that use uh, YDB specifically for this. So basically they store block devices data inside YDB's storage layer. So uh, ultimately uh, this reliability uh, property of block device became kind of anti-pattern for YDB usage because this reliability comes not for free and usually it either increases costs or uh, sacrifices performance with a fixed cost. Uh, and thus there are two viable options that uh, people are using YDB on. So first is local physical devices. We've just discussed various options how to attach them. Uh, so um, in this case you get the performance as close as possible to what you used to have in bare metal world. Uh, but you don't really get, get much advantage from Kubernetes on the... Mm -hmm. Uh, storage nodes because you'll sti still have to kind of pin um, storage nodes of uh, your like database application to each physical node, physical host. And but it still kind of makes sense because you'll get because of this separation of storage and compute, you can have get flexibility on the compute layer, which is also beneficial and makes sense for many use cases. Um, and the second option that also kind of popular is uh, non-replicated network block devices. So the ones that don't have extra uh, reliability built in. So it's just kind of network access to uh, 
physical device that's just connected to some other machine. Um, so it introduces extra latency just because of this kind of separation, because there's no guarantee that container and drive are on the same host. Uh, but in many cases it's tolerable because they're usually not so far apart, maybe in the same rack or like in nearby racks. Uh, and now you get this portability even for storage nodes, uh, which are again like beneficial if uh, like your company is more used to this fully flexible environment. And um, in reality, uh, uh, it's not hard to guess that the first option is more popular with bare metal uh, self-managed Kubernetes and the latter option is more popular with um, uh, managed Kubernetes in cloud service providers. But that's not necessarily the case. So there are some users who try, who use uh, WDB with opposite kind of options. So this is there you can use a project to that implements network block devices for you, uh, even in a non-managed Kubernetes environment. Uh, and even cl cloud providers often have VM types with uh, local SSDs, for example. Uh, they're just usually less easily available and uh, might, might not be ready for you when they ne you need them. So to, to kind of recap uh, lessons learned here, uh, first of all, even if you have weird requirements like we did, uh, nowadays Kubernetes community is so huge that likely you find a way to uh, implement whatever you need just because you are not the first one who actually had these requirements. There are so many people in this conference and in the whole community, so like it's hard to find absolutely unique uh, requirements. Uh, so it kind of becomes the opposite issue that there are too many ways to do the same thing with kind of little obscure differences. Uh, so you need to do a lot of research to kind of figure out what makes sense uh, under given circumstances. Uh, second, um, uh, as you can see, this migration from bare metal to Kubernetes didn't really require much changes in the core application architecture. Uh, so it's a good thing, even though like it all changed, but uh, uh, you can run stateless applications roughly the same as uh, in the bare metal world. Uh, but changes, changes in uh, surroundings, uh, uh, automation and uh, infrastructure kind of uh, around the core application was pretty significant. And last but not least, um, even though Kubernetes kind of abstracts away a lot of uh, underlying infrastructure, similarly how file systems abstract away uh, storage devices, uh, it still matters what's behind the scenes if you really care about uh, such characteristics of your application as performance and reliability. So you still need to understand what's going on on lower la layers of infrastructure uh, to build production grade systems uh, like this. Uh, and to wrap things up, uh, I want to remind you that YDB is an open source project. We are looking for contributors. Uh, the core platform is built from scratch in C++. We also have Kubernetes operator uh, written in Go that unfortunately I didn't have a chance to cover much today uh, and a bunch of other stuff. So if you're into stuff like this, uh, this core code leads to our GitHub organization. Uh, give us a star if you want to. Uh, or you can find us uh, as YDB platform there. So th uh, contributors are welcome. That's it. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask them now. Uh, or you can find me around. Uh, I'll be here tom today and tomorrow. Uh, or you can find me on LinkedIn. My name is Ivan Blinkov, um, and I'm happy to chat online as well. Thank you.